United States Department of State's first cultural envoy or first uh, ambassador for hip hop. And for those of you who know the State Department, they, you know, they, they work under the office of the federal government to ensure the world has peace and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there are various envoys. There's envoys for rock and roll and, and for peace and for justice and for music and all that, and specific areas. Uh, and hip hop is one, and your guest tonight is the first cultural envoy for hip hop. I'm going to just briefly say a few things and she'll take all about herself and her travels, but uh, uh, she has traveled uh, uh, over 30 countries across the world, uh, hundreds of cities in these countries, I mean, uh, uh, hundreds of cities in these countries. Uh, she is not just an artist, but, but she is an artist. She is an artist of the hip hop genre. Uh, uh, she, is, uh, she has numerous uh, albums and CDs out. Uh, uh, she has a new project now that she's working on with uh, 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 what she calls sort of African hip hop and African music and using the way those vibe with African drummers and delays and that type of thing. She, she's worked with the Lincoln Center with jazz uh, as a vocalist through the, the Lincoln Center. Uh, uh, so the first thing you understand that who you're going to have in front of you is an artist. And as an artist, she takes her craft seriously uh, and she's always engaged in her art. And so tonight she made you know, sort of get you involved in her artistic expressions. But not only is she an art, but she is an activist. And as an activist, she is concerned about the doings and sufferings of all those individuals who are on the underside, if you will, of oppression. And she does this not only in her context, growing up in, in Northern California, moving uh, uh, through Southern California over to uh, uh, Philly and through New York and back to D.C. and back to New York, so now she's in New York. Uh, uh, but she, so she's working on behalf of communities. But now, like I said, she's traveled across the world speaking on issues of democracy and social change and justice and hunger and famine and clean water and all those type of issues, but primarily issues of voice and inclusion. Uh, she works very, very diligently when it comes to young women and the voices of young women across the world. Uh, she, uh, I will forward a lot of people, if you email me, I'll forward you some very interesting work that, that she's done in Botswana. Uh, 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 and so she has, some, she has a very, very long uh, corpus of work. And lastly, I think she's a friend. I think that uh, that's the spirit that I cope with, well, not lastly. She's also a contributor. Shane Fulklove here. She is a contributor of my new uh, project here, uh, uh, Jay-Z Essays on Hip Hop's Philosopher King. It is a, 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 a new release that she actually is a contributor, the first contributor in this project. Her, her, uh, her, uh, her chapter deals with the history of black oratory, how, how um, tra tracing uh, communication and communication patterns among uh, 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 black leaders throughout the history of America and the world and seeing Jay-Z through that particular prism. I am proud to call her a friend for two reasons. One, just because I've known her uh, 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 you know, for 20 years, but primarily, and I tell this quick story as I do, sir, primarily, most of you in this room would not even know me if it wasn't for her. Most of you in this room would, I would probably, those of you who know me, I tell the story of you know, growing up, I stuttered a lot. I still stutter oftentimes. I stutter when I'm nervous. I'm stuttering around you know, uh, crowds like yourself, very intellectual young people. Uh, but when, when I was younger, I stuttered a lot. And, but I didn't let my stuttering define me. So I always kept talking and kept reading. And even when folks said stop reading, I kept reading any daggone way. And, and all y'all got, got mad, please don't let Julius read. And I'll say, I'm reading. It'll take me 10 minutes to read a one paragraph, but I'll get through it, right? And so I came to college, and, and I was still stuttering, but I was still active. I was on campus trying to fight the power, trying to be a revolutionary and a Christian at the same time, holding on to Jesus and holding on to a gun at the same time, doing, doing, doing it all, right? And, and, and I became being very active, and so I began to run for student body uh, 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 presidency, and the people who handled me, if you will, told me that, look, we can't put you out there unless you see somebody. I said, what do you mean see somebody? I said, we, we can't, put, we can't run a slate for you. We can't have you to represent our university as student body president um, without going to see Tony Black. 
So I'm thinking Tony Blackman is like a professor, you know what I'm saying, sitting in some office of communications. But Tony Blackman was a, just an upperclassman, lived in the dorms, who was an RA leader, who had a, a dorm office in the RA. And here I am talking to this sister, and she's stand up straight. What's up, man? I'm from Chicago. I got swag. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what's up? She was like, stand up straight. What are you doing? I started getting nervous. I started stuttering. What are you stuttering for? Talk, talk, talk when I talk correctly. Slow down. What's up, man? What's this shit? You know what I'm saying? What's really going on, right? And, and slowly but surely, she started building confidence in me. Because when everybody else was laughing at me and saying, Julius will never be student body president. Julius will never do that. He stutters too much. He can't. And I'm shying away. Tony believed in me at age 19, but when she was just 21. And she helped me through these issues. And so the fact that I spoke at graduation in front of 15,000 people, the fact that I've spoken across the world now is a testament uh, to this woman. And so I'm proud, not only as her colleague, and not only as a, a fellow contributor in my book, but I'm proud as representative of this fine institution uh, of, uh, of Whitburg University to uh, ask you to join me and welcome activist, artist, ambassador, and friend of mine. She's a friend of mine, she's a friend of yours. So help me to welcome Miss Tony Blackman. from my existence, my presence too often mistaken for absence. I am an invisible woman whose words don't flow fast enough, whose beats just aren't fat enough, whose contribution goes unseen. They know I am here because I was there. See, I rock the mic as he did. I spit rhymes as he did. I bought hip hop as he did. We nurtured it. I am an invisible woman. I am an invisible woman. Now, I may not be seen, but I'll be damned if I won't be heard. Hmm. All right, I'd like to start with that piece. It's called Invisible Woman. And I wrote that years and years ago when I decided that I was in, I was in college. And as a matter of fact, I had just started graduate school and I decided I wanted to be an MC. Um, I had worked as a corporate media trainer straight out of college, a communications <laughs> prodigy, they said I was. And I was bored to death. My stomach hurt when I went to work, my eyes watered, and I hated the thought of getting up and going back to deal with those people who took three hours to have the meeting to do something that took me three months and three minutes. And at the end of the day, I realized in doing this work, I wasn't writing poems anymore. I wasn't writing lyrics. I wasn't doing anything creative, and I wasn't doing anything in the arts, and, and I was miserable. I made a really dumb decision, and in a meeting where my boss was confronting me, I quit. But I didn't have a plan B, or a plan C, or a plan D. I had a nice apartment in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. I had a car and no plan. So I ended up waiting tables at Uno's Pizzeria. You guys know Uno's? Mm -hmm. And I used to love the four pizza. You guys know this pizza? I don't eat this stuff anymore. But I have food memories. And I remember working there being so miserable. And then I decided, well, if I'm going to be miserable, the least I could do is do what I want to do and do what I love. So I started going to events again. And I started networking and started meeting people. And I remember my grandmother, because I was in graduate school too at the same time, and my grandmother was sick with cancer. Um, she, she didn't have that much longer to live, and she was pissed at me. See, I was my grandmother's first child. She and my grandfather helped raise me. And when I said, she said, well, what are you doing? What do you mean you quit your job? Are you crazy? Are you still in school? I said, yes. Yeah. She says, thank God. And then it was the first and only time in my life I ever heard my grandmother curse. I had never heard my grandmother say a swear word. But she says, I'm not going to have this shit out of you. How embarrassing is this? You go to college for seven years to become a rapper? <laughs> You're going to write poetry? And I remember this 
moment distinct because when, before my grandmother died, she told my brother, tell your sister it's okay if she wants to be an MC. And I was very proud because my grandma knew what an MC was. <laughs> like, I'm a hip, that's how much of a hip hop head I was. My grandma knew what an MC was. And it also gave me a sense of freedom, right? Even though I didn't get to speak to her before I left. She died when I was on my way to South Africa. And I was one of the first artist exchanges that I was able to manifest because I decided at a certain point that the music industry wasn't working. But I still wanted to live and breathe music because this is what I do. So I said, I'll go elsewhere. <coughs> so I got an opportunity to go to South Africa and do exchange with South African <coughs> hip-hop artists. And that led to one exchange, to another, to another. And I started to find my peace in places like Darmstadt, Germany. I started to find my peace in Paris, France instead of here. And that's where I found my freedom. And I tell you today, I start, whenever I speak at universities, one of the most valuable pieces that you get as you move into adulthood is the ability to use your passport as an American. To use your passport and go wherever you want to go. Because I know that for me, not only did it change my life, it saved my life because it gave me a sense of purpose. And it also gave me the freedom to come back to America and deal with my challenges and struggles here. And this is what led me to do all the work that I do. I am a hip hop educator, a hip hop activist, a hip hop theater artist, a hip hop humanitarian, a hip hop diplomat, and everything in my life do need to be studied.